Let's finish up. Uh, this, this is our last Sunday in the book of Revelation. And so I'm going to have you turn to Revelation chapter 22, the final chapter as we kind of wrap this up. Again, Wednesday we'll cover chapter 22 in its entirety. But I like to do on Sunday morning just kind of a single uh, verse or two, maybe, uh, just to kind of uh, focus on a point, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at the whole thing Wednesday. Before we get to that verse, uh, uh, you know, I wonder how the Lord must feel, uh, you know, if you could even call it that, uh, about his kids and heaven. Um, the only thing I can read it to you, remember when you were a little kid and you were so excited to open presents on Christmas morning? Um, man, I, I loved that. It was always great. My parents always had fun ways of giving gifts. You know, they'd, they'd mess with our minds. You know, you know, my mom used to, you know, do the huge box. And you'd think, oh, what's in that? It's got to be amazing. And you open it up and there's another one. You have to open that one. There's another one, another one. And finally you get to this little like wedding ring box. And you're like, oh man, what good thing comes from a wedding ring box? Uh, as a kid, there's a boy, there's nothing in there that you care about. I remember that one Christmas, I was so excited because I knew my mom was into messing with my mind and we'd gone through like 20 boxes and finally I opened it up and there was a little note inside and it said, go out and look in the garage. And man, sure enough, it was that YZ125 motocross bike. Oh, I heard angels sing then too. It was great, man. Now, now I know my mom and dad loved that and everything, but, but here's the thing. Um, uh, as, as a parent, I had no idea. The fun as a kid is great, but the fun as a parent is awesome. I, I almost, when, when my kids were little especially, it was like I, I would um, get up earlier because I wanted to see their excitement. And when they got out of bed and they ran downstairs and they saw what we had purchased for them. And, you know, it's just like as a parent, there's something about the things you've prepared, the things you've wrapped up. Um, it's almost more exciting and seeing them all excited. Joey, when he was a little kid, he had this visible excitement that he had. It was like his whole body would just stiffen up and he'd go, Aah. he was just like, or, and Debbie and I would just laugh because he was just so excited about the presents he was about to open. And, uh, you know, that, that's just rewarding. That's good stuff. I wonder, I wonder if the Lord, uh, if you could almost, uh, I, I know that he's, he's not sinful in any way, shape or form, but does the Lord get giddy with excitement? I wonder, does the Lord just think, oh, this is gonna be great. Wait till they see what I've prepared for them. Because, well, the Bible talks about how eyes have not seen nor ears have heard uh, about the, all the wonderful things that the Lord has prepared. Uh, you know, Jesus even said to everybody, he said, hey, you guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. Uh, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, there's a, there's a, a sense of excitement that Jesus is saying, man, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and we know that creation took six days and on the seventh day, the Lord rested. But Jesus, he went away a couple thousand years ago saying, I'm going right now to prepare a place for you. Can you imagine uh, how amazing heaven's gonna be? Now, if you've been with us, you've been seeing pearly gates and golden streets. And some of you are like, well, I'm not really into that, man. I'm into other things, <laughs> not into to gold. Well, the point is not that you get a bunch of gold. The point is the streets are gold. In other words, it's pavement. It's, it's no, no big deal. Nobody's gonna walk up into uh, heaven and go, wow, golden streets. I don't think that's gonna be the point. Just like you don't walk outside today and say, wow, pavement, <laughs> asphalt, yay. You don't do that. Uh, asphalt, something you drive over, you know, you, it's just kind of something you put the dirty cars on and oil drips on it. Like when you have those uh, old vehicles, like my old 69 Land Cruiser, we called it the Valdez. Uh, no, it's just a whole other thing. But, but the pavement, man, it's just junk, junk. Uh, that's what heaven's saying, gold is junk. The point is, uh, in eternity, uh, there's gonna be a whole nother mindset, a whole, no, whole nother set of, of things that really uh, are impressive and I think it's glorious. Now, the, the end of the book of Revelation does touch on a few notions about heaven that are glorious. And we'll look at those on uh, Wednesday night. And, and it's going to be exciting. But the one thing the Lord always tells us, it, he doesn't spend as much time talking about, you know, heaven. In fact, he speaks more in the Bible about hell than he does about heaven. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and some people say, why does God talk, speak so much about, is he trying to scare us? Uh, one, one person put it, oh, what is God trying to scare the hell out of us? And I say, pretty much. Yeah. Because uh, he knows it's bad and he wants us not to go there. And the Bible even says the Lord would that none should perish, but that everybody would have eternal life. This is what God wants for his kids. 
And so God has prepared a place in heaven. But of all the things he tells us, he doesn't spend as much time talking about heaven itself, but he says, um, be ready for heaven. Be watching and waiting. It's almost more about the preparation time uh, of getting to heaven that he wants us to focus on here and now. And, and the reason, well, it's because, well, there's, there's distractions, aren't there? It's funny how his kids, uh, you know, we have distractions. Uh, remember when you're a mom and dad of little kids uh, trying to get your kids to do certain things? You know, Brookie, Casey, Joey, brush your teeth. So Casey and Brookie would dutifully go and brush their teeth. But Joey, well, he found ways to be distracted. He'd be on his way up to brush his teeth and he'd step on a Lego. Oh, there's a Lego. And wow. Joey, have you brushed your teeth? Oh, no, sorry, Dad. And he'd go up for a few more steps and find, you know, some other little thing to be distracted by. <clears throat> and then, you know, after a while, Joey, did you brush your teeth? Uh, Joey, open your mouth and you still see a Cheerio in there. Okay, go brush your teeth, man. <clears throat> and so really what we found is uh, you almost have to walk them in there. It, it, and you wonder, you know, does the Lord feel that way with us? Prepare for heaven. Get ready. I'm coming quickly. Don't be the foolish servant who doesn't know that the Lord's coming. Because, um, you know, the Bible speaks so much of, of the Lord and his coming. Uh, in fact, there's 300 times in the New Testament that speaks of the Lord's coming. That's pretty big. That's 300 reminders. The Lord's saying, I'm coming quickly. Behold. <coughs> Excuse me. And for that reason, I want to focus on the verse here in Revelation 22 because it, it's spoken of many times in the Bible. But in the book of Revelation, there's some, some uh, certain words attached to the coming quickly part that I want to explore. So first, right here in chapter 22, verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Again, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, this is an interesting thing. The, the, the word behold is one that we don't use very much. You don't hear me say behold if we're just hanging out, right? Uh, behold, I'm hungry. You'd say, that's weird, man. You're just being weird. Uh, none of us talk King James anymore. Didst thou have a good breakfast this morning? Uh, people think you're wacko. But uh, the word behold, it's sort of lost its meaning to us. We just kind of think it's some Christmas thing. Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. Uh, and you're like, yeah, this is something angels say. But in the language of the Bible, <coughs> behold is a word we don't really have its equivalent. Um, you might say, look. Or you might even say, check this out. In fact, the idea of check this out with an exclamation point, that's closer uh, because, see, the word behold is something that's the Lord saying, you really need to listen up on this. Whenever you come across that word behold in the New Testament, it's the Lord saying, this is important. In fact, sometimes you'll say it twice, like in the sto story of the sower of the seed. Uh, he says, behold, at the beginning of the story, and then he finishes the story, he says, behold, again. Man, that's something you really need to listen up on the story of the sower. You know, remember the, the word of God is the seed going into the heart of men. And some of the seed is plucked up by the fowls of the air. Others is stomped by the wayside, choked out by thorns, scorched by the sun. But there's one bit of the seed that actually takes root, springs up and brings forth good fruit. And that's the heart of, of the Christian who's ready to receive the seed of the word. And this brings good fruit in his life. And the Lord Jesus says, behold, this is something you really, really need to listen to. And so that word sometimes loses its meaning because of the King James. And even the way it's translated in the newer translations sort of misses the nuance in the sense that there's a sense of urgency, but also importance. So he's saying, behold, this is important. Check this out. He says, I come quickly. Now we're going to see today that he says, behold, I come quickly. That's number one. But then he's going to say, behold, I come as a thief in the night. That's number two. And then he's going to say, behold, I come surely. Those are the three things we're going to look at. So first, behold, I come quickly. Now, right there, some of you might already have a, a problem with that statement. Because John the Apostle wrote this there on Patmos, uh, probably around 90 AD. And so if you do the math, man, that's just under 2,000 years ago. The Lord spoke through the Holy Spirit, in, through Jesus Christ, to John the Apostle, and now to us. Only we look back almost 2,000 years, and he said, behold, I come quickly. And you say, see, the Bible is just wrong. That's just not true. The Lord is not coming quickly. It was 2,000 years ago when he said that. 
But there, there's something you should know, and this is important, not to just think this is some fancy exclamation or something like this. This is something the Bible spends a lot of time on, this idea of quick, quickly. There's, there's two main arguments you should know about of why we can still look at this and say, this is totally valid, what he's saying. Uh, there's several reasons. I'll give you kind of one that's um, maybe sort of important, for, for sure it's important, but then I'll, I'll tell you kind of the main thing that you need to know about this word quickly. Uh, so the first thing you need to know is quickly is a relative term. Do you know that? One of the things Einstein worked on was the theory of relativity, uh, which is an interesting thing, and I don't claim to understand it. In fact, when he was asked about how, how, how many people on the earth really understand his theory of relativity, he said two. He said, myself and the other person I'm still looking for. That's what Einstein said. But Einstein said uh, and came up with this idea that time and, and, and stuff is relative to other objects, whether they're moving or not, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, how, how, how much time goes by. And, and this is an interesting deal because, uh, for example, uh, it, you know, right now, uh, how fast are you going? Anybody? How fast are you going right now? See, there's a bunch of answers. One, one crazy person over here said a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> crazy. Because right now we know we're sitting here not moving at all, Right. You're going zero miles an hour. Oh, unless you factor in. See, this is a relative term. How fast are you going right now? Because relative to this building, relative to Portland, Oregon, you are going zero miles per hour sitting in your chair right there. But the nut who said a thousand miles per hour, (laughs) he's right. Because the earth, as it spins on its axis, we are going a thousand miles an hour relative to the surface of our planet, uh, to, the way, to our whole planet, I should say. We're going 1,000 miles an hour. Wow, we're flying. But actually, we're moving at a sales, snail's pace, aren't we? Compared to, well, relative to the sun, I don't even know the number. I remember it's somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of miles per hour we are going uh, in orbit around the sun. So you add that, do you add that to 1,000 miles? You don't because it's all relative to other objects. You see what I'm saying? Time is relative. That's, that's what we learn. And then if you consider, if you consider the, you know, our solar system and uh, you know, the Milky Way galaxy and, and, and our relation to those things, then time suddenly becomes very different. It's like this. Uh, here's another way to look at it. You know, the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. That's clipping along even faster than Tad drives in his Volkswagen. 186,000 miles per second. Let's, now, Einstein talked about the closer you get to that speed, time starts to slow. Uh, when you reach the speed of light, theoretically, uh, time stops. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Here, here's the deal. This is kind of the theory of relativity. If you were to go to the closest star that we know, of course, um, from here to Alpha Centauri, if you go 186,000 miles per second, it would take you four and a half years to get there. Now, assuming this, the, the, the time from here to there is the same as from there to here, which that's not necessarily sure, but if you, if you just do the math, how many years would it take you to get to Alpha Centauri and back if you were going to the speed of light? Nine years, right? Uh, four and a half plus four and a half. But here's the question. If you did that little journey, you got in your spaceship that went that fast, went to Alpha Centauri and came back, how much time would have gone by on Earth? 6,000 years. You'd be looking for Athey Creek. You're like, wait a minute. Where am I? Why is that? Well, it's time is relative, and, and the theory of relativity starts messing with time pretty crazy. So you say, Brett, I'm confused. Well, we should be. <laughs> because God is big, and when he created the cosmos, man, I believe he implies that he is not limited to just our puny concept of time and space, speed, and those kinds of things. In fact, one of the interesting statements of the Bible uh, for you that study science, it should be this, when God says, I am light. He is the very essence of light. It's not that he just said, I am the light of the world. The, the idea is that the Lord even is the embodiment of light. That's, that's interesting when you start thinking about energy and light and speed and all that stuff. But here's the thing. The reason I get into this is when, when uh, it says that the Lord Jesus is saying, behold, I come quickly, that's relative to what? See, that, I believe that God made it clear. And when talking about Bible prophecy, Peter clears this up to a degree, I believe. Uh, and this is, a good, this is a good passage. I've gone over this several times and I like to have people turn to these places 
in their Bibles so that you know where it is on the page so you can show people, because uh, these are important scriptures. Would you keep your finger here in Revelation and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3? We were here just even a few weeks ago when we were talking about the destruction of the earth. But Peter gives a word here that's kind of interesting uh, about this. Now, uh, last week, while you're turning to 2 Peter, uh, what's the name of that? The Colbert Report, is that right? Did I say that right? Uh, for those of you that watch that garbage. Anyway, um, no, just kidding. Uh, he, he did a, a whole thing on the, the goofy Bible prophets, the Bible prophecy. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. Somebody, you know, texted it to me and showed me the link and I went and watched the video and he's just totally making fun of people that believe in Bible prophecy and Joel Rosenberg even has Joel Rosenberg's, uh, uh, some of his interviews about Damascus and he just totally makes a total mockery of that. And some of my buddies were texting and they're like, ah, this is such a bummer, you know, all these Bible prophecy guys get such a bad rap and stuff. And, and so I texted back, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. I said, Colbert's fulfilling Bible prophecy. <laughs> See, it's exciting to me. Why? Because that's great. The more he mocks, the more he fulfills Bible prophecy. I wish I was there to congratulate him. Man, you are fulfilling Bible prophecy. Really? Yeah, check it out. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, totally fulfilling that prophecy right there, Colbert. Um, and it says, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Question, is that true? From the beginning of creation on this earth, have all things continued the same as they always were? No, think of one cataclysmic event. Anybody? The flood. Good. That's what Peter goes to. Verse five. He says, for this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. Uh, hello. You kind of forgot about a little thing that didn't happen normally. That didn't go on as it always had gone before. But verse seven, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For, it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Um, now, here's the thing. We'll get back to the thief of the night thing in just a minute. But the point is, Peter says something that sort of matches Albert Einstein's findings of the theory of relativity. And that is, well, in God's uh, existence, <clears throat> he sort of exists outside of the laws of time as we know them relative to earth. And that is that with the Lord, now notice with the Lord, that's kind of an important thing. Uh, when you uh, die and go to heaven and you are with the Lord, does that mean that when you are with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day? The answer is yes. That means that we sort of uh, step outside of the laws of time and space when we're with the Lord in heaven. Now this is, the implication is kind of interesting because many Bible theologians believe in what is called the eternal now. We've talked about this in previous studies but the implications are kind of amazing. If, if God exists outside of laws of time, and uh, we believe God has uh, so much more uh, dimension. We talked about that last week. I remember I talked about Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Was that Wednesday night? That was Wednesday night. If you missed that, well, you missed me talking about Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, d the dimensional uh, possibilities, you know, many of us know three dimensions, four if you include time. Um, and, uh, but Einstein talked about the possibility of being many, many more dimensions and others have come up with 14, 15, 16 dimensions that we haven't even considered. Uh, but, uh, science does imply that there's more than just our little world of dimensions that we know now. Could it be that God, when we're outside of, that we are outside of time, just like the Lord, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. In fact, Ecclesiastes, you can remember this 315, it says this, with the Lord, it says, that which hath been is now. That which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Huh? What did he just say? He said, that which has been, past, is now, present. 
and that which has uh, begun already hath already been, or uh, that which has begun has already been. In other words, to the Lord, time is relative, and that shouldn't be a shocker to any of us. Okay, so if a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, and the Lord says, behold, I come quickly, when, when John, John wrote this word down, how many days in God's economy would that be? A couple days, a couple days, it's just a short time. And if you think two days is long, then... Uh, you gotta kind of rethink that because the Lord says he's long suffering. He's being patient, not willing that any should perish. The reason the Lord continues to delay his coming is not for slackness. He's not a slacker, Peter says, but he's willing that none should perish. He wants everyone to be saved. So he's being patient. I bet you there's people in this room right now that are thrilled and glad that God didn't come back back in 1982 when uh, many of us thought it was that year because it was uh, the planets were aligning and we were all thinking, maybe this is it. And all these prophecies that came. Uh, and, uh, but you know, didn't come in 82. But see, Brett, that's just it. You Christians are always talking about these times of when the Lord can come back. But here's the thing. Uh, what we need to understand is the, the day or the hour, we don't know, but the Bible does speak of the times and seasons. We will know. So we're sort of to be watching and ready and, and sort of uh, be on the tip of our tongues and the forefront of our thoughts, thinking about the Lord's return. He says, behold, I come quickly. And the implication is that we're to do something about that. So this idea uh, that he's been gone for a couple thousand years, that to God, that's just a couple days. So that's the first line of reason. When, when John says, behold, I come quickly, speaking of the Lord return, um, you say, that's not quickly, 2,000 years, but it is in God's economy. But there's another nuance that I think is perhaps even more important. Because the word quickly is a, a word, uh, well, if you look at the Greek word, it's the Greek word takos. Now, in your car, many of you have two main gauges on your dashboard. You've got your speedometer. And what does that tell you? How fast you're going. Uh, but you also have your tachometer. What does that tell you? People are like, I don't know, I just like to watch it go, hoo, hoo, it's really great. No, no, the tachometer tells you how many revolutions per minute your engine is, is performing at that given moment. Revolutions per minute, your engine, yeah, some of you are learning something today, this is great. But, but if you're, if you're a one who's into cars and engines, you know that the tachometer is important. To, to, you, know, you don't want to over-rev your engine. A lot of your cars have rev limiters. For those of you who don't know how to use your uh, RPMs, and uh, it makes sure that you don't over-rev. Um, but you know, for people who like to go really fast, uh, revs are kind of important. You know that, that crazy kid that's next to you at the stoplight? He's like, woo, woo, in his little uh, Honda Civic, you know? He's all excited about burning off the, the rubber there. You know, he's woo, woo. And you're like, man, that's, 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 that's great. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing. Uh, but for those of us who like to drive fast vehicles and motorcycles, my dad, uh, he's into dirt bikes and, and sport bikes, and I grew up around motorcycles. And um, I've kind of avoided one of his uh, favorite hobbies is sport bikes. The reason I've avoided it is I really like going fast and, um, and I'm a pastor and it wouldn't be a very good testimony seeing me in jail because I was going 180 uh, on the way to church. That'd be bad. So I don't have one of those. But, uh, but, uh, but when I go down to Southern Oregon, I, my dad will sometimes let me take his GSXR out for a little spin. And, you know, on a controlled track, uh, only on safe uh, situations where there's no traffic and, you know, uh, but, but his bike rips and it's fun. Now, now I got just used to his bike and then um, uh, I went down um, uh, last year uh, and uh, he let me take his bike for a spin and he said, Brad, I put a new engine in this bike. He put in a Yoshimura engine in his GSXR. Now you bike people, you know what I'm talking about here. This is something big. And so I was like, cool, one of the fastest motors on the planet I get to ride. And so we took it out on the track and was able to, you know, take it for a spin. But to me, it felt sort of sluggish. I was like, no way. And I just didn't feel right. And I came back and my dad said, man, what were you doing? Uh, I said, well, I was just trying to get the feel of this thing. And he says, no, no, no. He said, with this engine, you know, with a normal GSXR, you're, you're going to rev it up to, I don't remember the exact numbers. I think it was 12,000, maybe, uh, as, high, as high as you get your Gixxer. But with the Yoshimir engine, you get up more to 14, 15 even 16,000 revolutions per minute. Do you know what that sounds like? Well, it brings chills to, I almost start to weep as I think of it right now. <laughs> because, 
the feel of a jigsaw. Now, I took it out again and started to rev it, and it just screams. You feel like the whole thing's gonna disintegrate, but that's where that engine likes to be at like 14,000 RPMs. That's when it just starts to pull really, really crazy. And you know, his bike will go 200 miles an hour, so it's a pretty fun little ride. Now, all that to say, I love revs. I love RPMs because, because there's something about that that's kind of powerful. Now you say, Brett, what does that have to do with the Bible? Well, here, here's the thing. The, the Greek word is tachos, tachometer, which is the same thing. That ta- it doesn't have to do with how quickly or as far as speed, but it has to do with revolutions per minute. It has to do with something that's winding up, something that's ramping up. That, that it's, it's starting to wind out. Those are terms maybe you, you, uh, you know, motorcycle enthusiasts know, that uh, it's all about getting the RPMs up. And that's the word, tachos. It's a word that really, it's hard to actually use for many of us in our thinking as far as what the Lord's saying, behold, I come quickly. The idea is that the, the, the Lord's return is gonna ramp up to a screaming pitch. Does anybody feel like we're starting to rev up pretty loud right now? The world's kind of ramping up, revving up. Uh, it's starting to hit that rev limiter where you're like, man, I don't know, it's, she's breaking up, she's breaking up, right? Uh, that's kind of the, where the world is at. You see, that's kind of more what we should be looking at. Not as much, okay, quickly, Lord, we're looking at our watch, wrong instrument. We look at the tachometer, the, the ramping up of when the Lord returns. That's the, what the Bible's teaching. There's another theme for those of you that aren't into dirt bikes or, mo- or street bikes or anything like that. Uh, for you pregnant ladies, you know what he's talking about when he says, it's like a woman who's in travail in childbirth. What happens? Same thing. It's just not revolutions per minute. It's contractions per minute. And they get more intense and more frequent when the baby comes. And that analogy is used even more than the word tacos. How the, the coming of the Lord is gonna be like the woman who's pregnant and, and that the baby's coming. So that's prophecy language right there. So really, it's not that the Bible's wrong, it's the Bible's exactly right. And what we're seeing happening around the world and the people mocking about Bible prophecy, we see the wars and rumors of wars, just like Jesus said, the earthquakes in diverse places and all kinds of trouble that uh, Matthew 24 talks about. The Bible is right to say it'll rev up until the very end to where it's gonna be over-revved and that's when the Lord's gonna come. So he says, behold, I come quickly. Now you say, okay, Brett, what does that have to do with me? Average athy creaker sitting in the warehouse on a Sunday morning. Well, the point of telling us over and over and over in the Bible, behold, I come quickly, is the point is he wants readiness from his church. He wants people in his church to be ready for the Lord's return. He doesn't want to find us uh, just being the lazy servant doing nothing, sitting around saying, oh, the Lord couldn't come back in our day. I don't believe Christ is, by the way, that was sad, but we've talked about this all through Revelation. There's a lot of churches that are taking that attitude and they, they make a, a sort of a, in my opinion, a very weak theological defense. Oh, we don't go through the book of Revelation because it's too divisive. Have you heard that one? Uh, we don't talk about end time stuff. A lot of churches don't even mess with the end time stuff, even though it's one fourth of the Bible. They won't hit Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel, Isaiah. They don't hit the books of prophecy, you know, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. They don't talk about that stuff because it's too divisive. Or they take an interpretation and say, it's all all figurative. You can't take any of it literally. Meanwhile, everything is literally coming to pass. And the ramping up, the revving up of this world, it's getting to that feverish pitch. And people are missing out. The Lord says, I want you to be aware that I'm coming. So what are we called to do? Well, it tells us in the second part of our verse, behold, I come quickly, blessed or happy is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. What are we to be about in light of the fact that the Lord's coming back? We're we're to be about keeping the word, keeping what the word says and specifically the book of Revelation. And there's plenty of that. If you missed that, you maybe need to go back and study chapter one through the rest of the book of Revelation if you missed it. There's plenty for us to do, plenty for us to think about uh, and and to live out after having gone through the book of Revelation. So this idea of being busy about the kingdom. Now, keep your finger here still in Revelation. Let me show you uh, another thing that Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 24. So in light of the fact that it's ramping up, revving up, the Lord's return is coming, he tells us that we are to be uh, those who watch and are ready. That's why he says, behold, I come quickly. Listen up, he says. But check this out, Matthew 24. 
Verse 42. This is the Olivet Discourse where he's talking about the, the end times. Jesus was asked by the disciples, what, when is the end of the world? And Jesus told them this whole section of red letters. So it's a pretty big section. Uh, but there in Matthew 24, verse uh, 42, he says, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch or what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now pause for a second. Again, we have the thief analogy. Keep that tucked away because that's coming up more uh, in our discussion. But uh, he says, he wouldn't let your house be broken in if you knew the thief was coming. Verse 44. Now this is where this should apply to you and to me. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the son of man cometh. By the way, that's a mark of when you can know the Lord's coming or not coming is when everybody says he is coming, he's not coming. That's why uh, before Y2K, we were actually in Reve book of Revelation um, uh, right before Y2K. That was the last time I was in the book of Revelation, a few years back. Uh, and, um, and I was teaching about this and there were people in our church even freaking out, oh, the end is coming, it's Y2K and January 1st, the Lord's coming back. And there were people selling their stores and their businesses and I was saying, you guys, man, chill out. Stop it. Uh, don't be wacko, weirdo uh, prophecy people. But, but keep your minds because, uh, you know, they were saying it was going to be on January 1st. Uh, the Lord's coming back. So I went on record. Uh, you can download the teachings months before Y2K actually happened. And I said, man, sell your generators, sell your Cheerios and get rid of your bunkers. It's not going to happen. I told people that. And I said, they said, how could you say that? How do you know it's not going to happen? I said, because everybody's saying it's going to be that day. And the Lord says it's coming on a day when nobody's expecting it, when you're least expecting it. Like, for example, I even said, could it be that the Lord is going to come on the last day of December? 1999? Wouldn't that be like the Lord? Everything is going to be the first day of 2000. Uh, but the Lord says at an hour when you think not. So when you least expect it, that's the idea. And you can know when people write a book and say the, uh, Harold Camping came out with this thing. Lord's coming back. What was his date? I don't even remember. Nobody remembers the date. Was it May 21st or something like that? I forget but it never came to pass. It was William Miller, who they were called Millerites. That was their theology. The people followed William, William Miller. And uh, do you know, back in the 1800s, hundreds of thousands of people followed his teaching and they were stoked about his teaching. One of the things he started to do was to name times where he thought the Lord was gonna come back. And when those times passed, People would be bummed out. He says, oh, no, no, wait, we got to recalculate. And then he'd get another time. And, and the Millerites, who later became the Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists, this is kind of a, a, a bad mark on Adventism. If you're an Ad Adventist, uh, you don't like to talk about this, but it's true. Let's face it up. Uh, but Miller actually started to name dates. And when they passed, people would be really bummed. Well, it came down to sort of the final date there. Uh, I think it was October 22nd, uh, 1844. Uh, that was the date. And so they all went out under the mountain and waited for the Lord's return that night. Uh, and they waited there like Linus waiting for the great pumpkin. And the sad truth is, is they were naming the day. And it's an hour when you think not. No man knows the day nor the hour. Why do people think they can figure it out? That should always be a red flag to you. If, if some pastor or church leader says, this is the time when it's happening, you say, you're wacko. Uh, and you, you are wrong about that because the Bible, Jesus said even he didn't know uh, the hour when his father would. Uh, and, and that goes back to the Jewish wedding thing we talked about a few uh, Sundays ago. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour. Uh, but the sad thing is the Millerites, by the way, they call that the, the day of or the great disappointment. Did you know that? This, uh, ask the Seventh-day Adventists, explain the day of disappointment to me. And it's really kind of a sad thing because everybody, in fact, William Miller himself wrote uh, in some journal how he and his followers wept for days because they knew they were wrong. And he even wrote uh, an apology saying I was wrong and I made an error in my calculations. And some of them continued to calculate and try to figure out. But um, the sad thing is the, the great disappointment will always be that when you start naming days or hour. 
Here, back to Matthew 24, it says, um, at an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, or the word blessed is King James for happy. Happy is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he's not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whew. Now, I'm not saying uh, that uh, this scripture is necessarily saying that anybody who's um, believing the Lord's not coming back soon, uh, that they're all going to go to hell. I don't know that that's saying, but here's what I would say. Do you really want to be in the company of the last people that are talked about here? The wicked servant that says, ah, the Lord delays his coming. Now, by the way, did you know the pre-trib view of eschatology is the only view that says the Lord could come back right now? There's uh, what we call imminence. What's the doctrine of eminence? That his return is imminent, that we don't know. It could be today. Now, what's interesting is John and Peter and Paul, in all their writings, you get the sense that they believe the Lord could return in their lifetime. Oh, but Brett, that's just dumb then. They were wrong. No, they were exactly right, because here was the point. The point was the Lord wants his servants living as if he could come back today. You're not partying down. You're not blowing it with sinful things saying, ah, oh, the Lord delays is coming. That's the, the servant Jesus said, that's the wicked servant. I don't want any part of that. I want to be the servant that says, man, I'm going to just be busy about the work of the kingdom and I'm going to serve the Lord with all of my might. And when he comes, if it's today, cool. If it's tomorrow, awesome. If it's 10 years from now, wonderful. But no matter when it is, I, I hope that he finds me and I hope he finds Athey Creekers busy about the work of the kingdom, serving the king. Um, and the one who does that is found faithful and the, the rewards are gonna be great, the Bible says, for that Christian who does that, lives that way. Um, you see, the other views of Bible prophecy, like for example, the post-tribber, um, there's a lot of things that need to happen before the, the rapture of the church. If you believe the rapture is happening at the end of the tribulation, man, we gotta wait for a temple to be built in Jerusalem. We gotta wait for Antichrist to come on the scene, this coming world leader. And we gotta see the abomination of desolation that's talked about in Matthew and in Daniel where he sets himself up to be worshiped. There's a ton of things uh, before Christ can come back. So if you're a post-tribber uh, and also um, if you're a post-tribber, you should probably be building a bunker in your house and getting guns and Cheerios and all that stuff because you're gonna have to go through the tribulation. And that's a horrible thing. See, I, I, that's not about the king's business. That's about your own business. And by the way, the whole bunker and Cheerio gun thing, uh, what are you gonna do? I always say this because I, I, there's a lot of Christian circles that they sort of act like they're gonna defend themselves during that time. Uh, is that Christ-like? During the tribulation, if, you're, if, if you were to live through that time, which I don't believe we are, but even if we go through hard times, you get your neighbor knock on your bunker door, coo, 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 <clears throat> can I have a cup of Cheerios? We're starving out here. Boom, you kill them dead because they want your Cheerios. That's, that's, God bless you. <laughs> Is that what you're gonna do? Uh, I don't see how that works out in a Christ-like kind of way. It's kind of funny. I know, I know that there's other scenarios some of you are thinking about, but man, think about it, really? Now, the point that I make is this, uh, the pre-trib view, which I firmly believe, um, is, is that which leaves room for eminence, that he could come back at any second. There's nothing biblically, prophetically that needs to happen today that's holding back the rapture of the church. That gives us a sense of expectation. And by the way, that's why in 1 John chapter 3, John says there in the first few verses of that chapter, he says, he who has this hope, the hope of the Lord's return, purifieth himself. That is, if you believe that the rapture of the church can happen today after church, you're not gonna go uh, get drunk and party down and do all kinds of sexually promiscuous things because, man, the Lord's coming back. There's a purifying effect that takes place on the Christian who's serving the Lord, who believes the rapture of the church can happen at any moment. Eminence, I think it's an important doctrine of the end times. Well, that's the, the first thing. Behold, I come quickly and I need to finish quickly. 
tekos. Um, there's two more that we'll go quickly over. Not only behold, I come quickly, but also in the book of Revelation, he adds on another theme that we've already touched on. Behold, uh, verse uh, 15 of chapter 16. Flip back a few pages. Revelation 16, verse 15. Here he says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Man, John's getting quite uh, elaborate with his uh, illustration there. Uh, do you ever really want to be caught naked? Uh, most people say that's kind of embarrassing. Um, I can't resist to tell this story. It's kind of a horrible story as I think about it, but at the time we couldn't believe what happened. Tad and I had a group of kids. We were driving these two school buses, 89 passenger bluebirds. Uh, and we were, uh, we, we'd take kids out. We, we, uh, back in the day when I was the director of youth ministries, uh, all summer long, we'd go on these fun trips to uh, rivers and lakes and jump off rocks and stuff. It was great. And we had a group of elementary kids and we took them up to the lake. The lake was really low that year. There was no great place to swim. So we took them up the road a little bit to where we knew there were some neat swimming holes and places to jump off rocks. The problem with that area in Southern Oregon, uh, with all the hippies that were down there from the 60s that are still there smoking weed, um, the problem is you, there was a bunch of skinny dippers that you had to kind of beware of. Uh, being that it was a weekday, it was very unlikely that there'd be skinny dippers. So uh, we drove the bus up and we parked the bus and, and then Tad and I'd leave the counselors and all the other adults there and, and he and I would go two by two uh, as the Bible prescribes uh, and we would go just to make sure there were no skinny dippers down there because you couldn't really see down in the, where this, uh, this sort of gorge area was. You couldn't see unless you kind of walked over. So we walked over and sure enough, there was a couple down there just dark naked, uh, having a great time. So we, we quickly came back and we thought, man, we gotta, well, the couple saw us. Then I think they realized there was a school bus of school children there. And I don't know what they were thinking, but they were probably thinking, we gotta get out of here. Um, so, so Tad and I are running back to the bus. We're firing up the buses, you know, whoo, getting ready to leave because we thought we just, but sure enough, this couple started walking up toward their vehicle, which was up by the bus. And um, so Tad and I are like, don't, uh, don't look over there. We're like, hey, kids, look at those rocks over there, man. Look at that. Um, and uh, this couple, totally naked, walking up. Well, here's the thing where it actually gets kind of sad. We're, we're driving out, and one of the little girls in our group, little seven-year-old girl, she's looking out the other way, and she says, that's my mommy. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, and we found out also that the guy that was with her was not her daddy. And so Tad and I are just like the whole rest of the day, we're just dying a million deaths saying, oh man, what just happened there? Well, we, we finished the day, had the day, the kids, we found a place to swim. There was no naked people. And, um, and so we went and uh, dropped the kids off at the various locations. We dropped at Van Ways Market, Fred Meyer. Kmart was the last stop. All the kids were picked up and, and except for this one girl who had seen her mommy that day. And we were just there talking with her and Tad and I were kind of waiting in the bus. We waited two hours because I think the mom was so ashamed, which she should have been, but she was so ashamed. I think she was afraid to show her face and pick up her own daughter. And we were just sitting there kind of waiting, wondering what in the world are we going to do? We tried phoning and calling and all that stuff. But finally the mom rips up in her car and she rolls the window down like two inches and says, yells to her daughter, get in the car. And it just broke our heart, you know, because we saw what was going on with this poor little girl and her mom and the family. We knew it was a mess. But, you know, that, that woman, she must have thought, what are the odds of me getting caught? Um, the Bible says, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Uh, that's probably the most horrible way I can think of, of having your sins found out. But the point is simply this. Uh, if, picture that analogy and how ashamed that woman is. That's what John's trying to paint right here for us. He's saying, if you're not really watching and waiting and you're, you're, you're not aware that the Lord's coming, he's coming as a thief in the night when you least expect it. Do you really wanna be found doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing? Caught red-handed? Do you really wanna be busted, found naked and open before the Lord? The, that's, that's the analogy, the thief in the night. It's not just there, but also real quick, First Thessalonians uh, says in chapter five, I'll just read it to you. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now listen, for when they, not us, when they say 
peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, there it is, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunk are drunk in the night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and a helmet, the hope of our salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that's glorious news. Uh, now, now, what thief announces his coming? Hey, I'm coming over to your house tonight, gonna rob you blind. <laughs> you can just count on that. What would you do if, if you knew the thief was coming? but you didn't know what time of the night he was coming. Have, have you got your game plan? Man, I'm getting out my golf clubs. I'll be standing right there next to the door with my golf clubs. Well, what would you do? Well, here's the thing. The point is, is the world is gonna be caught as a thief because they're opposing the one who's coming. That's why the negative connotation. But to us, he's not coming as a thief. He's coming as our glorious savior. And that's why he says, comfort one another with these words. The idea of the thief, he's come, he says, behold, I come as a thief. The point is we should be busy about his business, serving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Very, very key. Well, lastly, then we'll wrap it up. Not only does the Lord say, behold, I come quickly, behold, I come as a thief, but also he says, behold, I come surely. Check it out in our text here in chapter 22 of Revelation. Again, Revelation 22 Second to the last verse of the Bible. If you got two more verses in the Bible to say something, what are you gonna say? We'll look at the last thing that he says on Wednesday night, the very last sentence, which you can't look at right now <laughs> because you're faithful. But we're gonna look at the second to the last verse. What is on God's heart to say at the very second last verse of the Bible? Check it out. It says here in verse 20, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. What does the Lord say? He says, surely. And we're not talking about a girl named Shirley, right? We're talking about the Lord is for sure. You know, I could say, hey, this week I'll meet with you. Let's go grab coffee. We'll go do this and, and let's do it. And you say, okay, but I can't say, behold, surely I will be there. And I'll tell you why I won't say surely. I'll say, man, Lord willing, we'll get it together. Why? Well, because things happen, unforeseen circumstances, right? I mean, that's, that's possible. It could happen to you. It could happen to me. Unforeseen circumstances. You might get sick. I might get sick. I might have a flat tire like I did at the wedding I had a few weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, and you just kind of, whoops. Uh, man, fortunately, we did the wedding. Then the tire was flat, but we got it fixed. Um, but, you know, it's like uh, there's things that are unforeseen. Here's the question. Is anything with God unforeseen? So when the Lord says surely, he means surely. It's as sure as sure can be. Nothing is surer than what the Lord says because he, he, does, he knows all things. So when he says surely I come quickly, man, God cannot lie. It's for sure that God is gonna do what he says he's gonna do. 300 times I told you he says in the New Testament he's coming. 50 times in, the, in Paul's writing, Paul says be ready for when he comes. And if you really believe that we're living in the, in the last days, the question I leave you with is, how has that changed your life? Are you living differently today after having gone through the book of Revelation and realizing that the Lord says he's coming and it's ramping up, it's revving up and we're seeing the events around the world revving up to, to be that day of the Lord that's talked about. How, how is this changing your life? And if we live exactly like we lived before we were Christians or before we knew the Lord was returning, is the word really doing its work in our lives? Is there a change taking place? Is there a sense of urgency about our lives, of, of redeeming the time, living for the Lord? Man, it's so important. Uh, I heard the quote, he who provides for this life, but takes no care for eternity is wise for a moment, but a fool forever. Man, I think that's true. We need to be preparing for eternity, living our lives for eternity. That's what the Bible teaches us. You know, the world tries to predict things but we don't have a clue. I saw uh, Weekly World News, May 24th, 1994, top psychic, Sabrina, made predictions about the future. This was in 1994. She said, in 1996, the temperatures in the world will plunge 
an average of 35 degrees and we'll move into an ice age. She also said the Grand Canyon will be closed because the federal government will use it for the waste, a waste dump. In 1996, Hillary Clinton will divorce Bill and run for president herself. Okay, so she's pretty close there. <laughs> Number four, in 1997, a law where we can kill wanted criminals will be passed. These are things she said. Sabrina was wrong. And the world was like holding their breath? I don't think so. You know, it's funny, even smart people. Huh? I like this one. Listen to some of the smartest people in the world, uh, what they said about things. A rocket will never be able to leave the Earth's atmosphere. That was the New York Times in 1936. Um, this one, some of you Boeing employees uh, will appreciate this one. A Boeing engineer after the first flight of the 247, which was a twin engine plane that held 10 people, Boeing engineer said, there will never be a bigger plane built. <laughs> Albert Einstein, I mentioned him and his theory of relativity. We give him credit for that. But do you wanna know what he said in 1932? He's a fairly smart individual. He said, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable it would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. That was Albert Einstein. He was kind of right that the atom would have to be shattered at will, but to say that it would never be obtainable, uh, that's not right. Um, this is great. Everyone acquainted with this subject will recognize it as a conspicuous failure. That was Henry Morton, president of Stevens Institute of Technology, speaking about Edison's light bulb in 1880. Uh, this is a good one. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty. It's just a fad. <laughs> that was the president of Michigan Savings Bank advising Henry Ford's lawyer not to invest in the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Zanuck, movie producer, 20th Century Fox, 1946. Television won't last long because people get, will, will get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. It's <laughs> a good one. Um, this, this one kind of cracked me up. Newsweek was predicting popular holiday spots for the 1960s. Um, this was one of their big picks uh, in the late 1960s. He said, uh, for the tourist who really wants to get away from it all, safaris in Vietnam. <laughs> Slightly wrong on, on that one. Hiram Maxim, who was the inventor of the machine gun, in response to the question, will this gun not make war more terrible? Um, and he answered, no, it will make war impossible. That's what he thought. A um, few more that kind of cracked. This is a great one. Um, Variety Magazine in 1955 said this, it will be gone by June. What were they speaking of? Rock and roll. <laughs> Here's a good one. Margaret Thatcher, she made this statement. She said, it will be years and not in my lifetime before a woman will become the prime minister. <laughs> she became the prime minister of England. Um, Anyway, I got a lot more of those, but the point is, we're stupid. <laughs> Even our smartest people, man, we think we know what's gonna happen, we think we know what's in the future, but here the Bible continues to be perfect, telling us what the future will look like, and we see uh, with such accuracy uh, what the Bible says. So what are we to understand? Behold, the Lord says, listen up, I'm coming quickly. So what do we do about that? We're to live out the word of God, to do what the Bible tells us to do, to be more faithful today than we were yesterday because the Lord is nearer to his coming than he was yesterday. So we should be about his business. We should be saved, first of all. If you're not a Christian, man, you're a sinner who needs to be saved. Otherwise, you're that, that person that's described in Matthew 24 who's the wicked servant who doesn't even believe the Lord's coming. Man, I hope that, that there's a heart change for you on that, that you repent from your sins, believe in Jesus, that he came, died on the cross for our sins. And the Bible says he rose from the grave, which was the proof he was who he claimed to be. One of the most provable facts in all of history, the resurrection of Jesus. And so you wanna be saved first and foremost. Then once you're saved, you're not saved by your good works or your good deeds. The Bible tells us that. But as a response to the salvation God's given us, then we are, are busy about his work to serve the Lord, to love the Lord, to worship the Lord, but be ready for his coming. I hope he finds Athey Creekers ready to roll, not partying down, not hitting their brother in the face like it says here, but instead just serving the Lord. That's what we need to be, amen? Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Lord, we are thankful for this good reminder that 
the revving up of the end does seem obvious to many of us. For those that are skeptics or cynics, Lord, I pray that they would instead take a hard look at your word from cover to cover and see how exacting it is. Lord, open eyes that people might see that your word is true and right and these warnings to watch and to be ready. Lord, I pray that that would fall on hearts, the soil that would be fertile soil and bring forth good fruit. May your church be on fire and may we, Lord, in these last days, live our lives holy for you. And Lord, I pray that if there are those who've yet to become Christians and, and believe, I pray that you would stir hearts today. Those in this room or, or maybe watching online or later listening to this teaching, I pray that the hearts would be changed and people would be saved. So bless your church as we go our way. Lord, we pray your blessing on the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're not a Christian and you want to be a Christian, if you feel like a stirring in your heart this morning, good news. It's easy. You don't have to do anything, uh, pay money. You don't have to join a church. It's confession and belief. I'm going to have a few pastors back by that exit sign back there. And they'll just hang out and they can pray with you. And uh, you can go and be saved. So before you go, give someone a hug. Then you can be dismissed. God bless you.